Howdy do, friends! And welcome back to project two of three in my collaboration series with Shaper. This time, we're making a wall hanging cabinet. Now this is an excellent learning project because not only is it a delightful object, it also has some really fantastic techniques for you to learn. And the three joinery techniques we're gonna learn in this video, number one, dados. Number two, the sliding dovetail. And number three, the housed mortise and tenon joint. A wide array of fantastic joinery, all three joints that I use in my professional career as a furniture maker. So I'm excited to take you through it. Let's get busy. So right off the jump, I want to say that your goal as the student in this project should be to execute the joinery as cleanly and accurately as possible. However, before we ever get to the joinery, you already have your first design aesthetic decision to be made, which is grain selection. Now, grain selection is important, one that we didn't worry too much about in the first project because we were just getting oriented with the origin and going through the work process and learning how to build. But now, now you got a little experience under your belt. Consider how the grain might affect the visual balance of a piece. So... Do you have the flare, that cathedral grain of the flat sawn board to one side? Is it centered? Is it at an angle? These are things that you can manipulate now. And I do also want to say this is just a leftover board of cherry, just a single 10 foot board that I used for all but the back panel of this project. And the back panel was also made out of a scrap. So it can be done. You can make nice furniture out of flat sawn hardwoods. You don't need all of the curls and the bird's eyes and the crotches. Practice simplicity and see if you can make an interesting object, but this is where it all begins. Now, once you've got those decisions under your belt, you can go ahead and go through the milling process. Again, if you're doing this with middle schoolers or with high schoolers and you're making 15, 20 of these, just leave them all at three quarters. You're going to make your life a lot easier. However, if you're in your home shop, know that for this project, the top is 11 sixteenths. The sides are five eighths and the divider in the center is a half inch. So you've got three different thicknesses there to machine to, not including the back panel. And those varying line weights really do add a lot of depth and dimension to the project. So just something to bear in mind. And if you have time, I always sticker my wood at least overnight, if not over the weekend, uh, just to give it time to breathe and acclimate to the environment, especially if you're doing so in those changing seasons. Now we dive right into the joinery. I've got my board set up and the first thing I'm gonna do is my dado cuts. So I've got this set up so I can make repeatable cuts top and bottom of both cabinets. The joinery is gonna be laid out in the exact same spot. And all I'm going to do is make a 1 8 inch deep dado. Now, I did not draw this on tool. Uh, I used the exact same layout for both cabinets and I'm doing a more advanced version of a dado for the later cabinet. I'm just not cutting the two inner mortises. However, you can absolutely lay this out on tool the same way I showed you in the previous project, just by creating a rectangle and adding the radius of one eighth of an inch since we're using a quarter inch cutter. And you can knock this out in a matter of minutes. You can see my pencil marks are still on my wood from when I did the scan of the piece just previously. So. Takes no time at all, knocks that out one eighth of an inch, and then I go in with my zero offset and I make it the appropriate or final width. And it's done. Two passes, and it took me literally maybe 30 seconds. Not an exaggeration. Once I have my mortise cut, then I'm going to switch it out and do the positive part of the dado. You can do a full width dado. Again, if you're doing this with multiple students, you may want to bump the size of that dado up to three quarter uh, to house the entirety of the width of the board. But, you know, we're trying to do some advanced furniture, so the dado is slightly smaller than the final thickness of that board. Now on to joinery number two, the sliding dovetail. Now, you can lay this out on tool. I did it, it's fine. However, 
I do want to point out that this is technically a double tapered sliding dovetail, meaning that it's widest at the back and thinnest at the front, and the difference is about a sixteenth of an inch. So as before, I'm going to provide you the SVG file for this so you can just upload it and lay it out on your tool rather than having to draw this up in a CAD program. But once you have it set up, just make sure that your offsets are as follows. 3 eighths of an inch deep, 3 eighths diameter, and then your offset can be done in two passes for the positive part. Now something I want to point out, these sliding dovetails can get tricky and complicated. I'm using a half inch, 10 degree bit. As long as you use that same bit, you can follow my numbers exactly. Mine happens to be an eight millimeter shank. You can get a quarter millimeter shank to do the exact same thing and you will be fine. The only reason it gets a little bit complicated is because you have to put in two different diameters for the actual cutter, depending on whether you're cutting the positive or the negative. So now that the positive is cut and everything looks good, now it's time to cut the negative. And again, here's where we change things up. So when I go to actually cut this, three eighths of an inch deep again, but the key is the diameter is a half inch now. There's a long video on Shaper's website that you can watch that will explain this in further detail. Don't really need to get into that detail now. Just trust me, half inch bit, 10 degree, you can use those exact same numbers and you will be a-okay. You'll get an excellent joint. Now I do want to point out the first offset that I'm using is 0 0.005 and then I will go through with a zero offset and that will allow me to take out the bulk of the waist now and then get very, very close to a final fit. And if I need to open it up by 0 0.001 or 0 0.002 or a negative 0 0.001 or 0 0.002, I should say, then that will allow me to get a nice clean joint that has enough play in there to, to glue it together when the time comes. Remove those burrs with the sandpaper and just give it a nice dry fit. And it is a nice, clean, tight joint. Then it's time to cut the rabbit on the back of the cabinet to fit the back panel. Now again, if you have multiple students, it may be best to set up a separate workstation so that they can do the joinery on the origin workstation and do the rabbiting on another such as the router table. Then it's time to dry fit the cabinet and do some curvature. This build goes pretty quick because it really is only six joints. So once you have them cut dry fit it, you can mark your curve in one of two ways, either with a drawing bow like I'm doing, or you can do it on the shaper in the exact same manner that we did the handles for the box, go most of the way through in this case, these are 11 sixteenths. I would go half inch, and then you can bandsaw the rest off and use a flush trim bit to clean it up. But in this case, what I'm going to do is to double stick these two pieces together, and I'm gonna do what's called a gang cut over on the bandsaw. So because these are mirror imaged, I can cut through both of them simultaneously, and I know I will get a consistent cut from top to bottom without any variation. And then I'm going to take it over to the belt sander and just ease these into their final profile. It doesn't have to be exactly to the pencil mark. As long as it's a smooth curve, you can shape it by hand afterward and nobody's gonna know the difference. And now it's time to do a little hand shaping. So I like to draw these thumbnails on and then shape them by hand. You can use a router, you can put a chamfer or a round over on this cabinet. Again, that might be your aesthetic decision that you decide to change and play with. I just think that handmade profiles, hand planed profiles add a lot of livelihood to an object and they really promote high quality craftsmanship. So if it's something that you're interested in playing around with, I highly recommend that you do that and work on those hand tool skills in accordance with your machine skills as you're developing as a woodworker. And you can see a mix here of hand planes and spoke shaves. 
I'll also use a file on these from time to time to really smooth out a curve. All depends on what you have available to you to work with and what you're trying to teach your students. And then after a final sand, it's time to glue up. Now this is what I love about these sliding dovetails the most. The glue up is so easy if the joint is right because they're self-squaring. Everything is tight at the end. So when you drive the joint home, it's almost impossible for this cabinet to be out of square when you glue it up. And you don't really need clamps because again, the only pressure that needs to happen is back to front. So if you drive the joint all the way home with glue in there, there's no reason to put a clamp on it. I'll throw a clamp on the center here just so that I know that the dado itself is closed just in case there's any kind of bow in the top and bottom panel. But that's one clamp for the entire cabinet. If that's not an easy glue up, I don't know what is. Now the finishing process for this project is actually less important than what happens after the finishing process. So after a couple of coats, you saw that I had the back panel taped in the areas where it's going to be glued to the back of the cabinet. So I remove that blue tape and I get ready to glue it in place. Now this is not a frame and panel. This is just a normal panel, which means that because it's wood, it will expand and contract with the seasons. And so I'm only gluing it in that center four inches or so to allow it to expand and contract over the course of 12 months. Now, I did the math. This is really only going to expand or contract somewhere in the range of 128th. So a playing card or two playing cards is more than enough room to allow this to move seasonally and not do any damage to the cabinet over time. Then I'm just going to throw a couple of clamps right in the center there so I know it's making contact with that divider. And then I'm just going to let it sit in clamps for an hour or so and it's going to be good to go. And the beautiful thing about pre-finishing panels like this is when you do get some squeeze out, you can just scrape it off with a ruler, come in with a wet rag and clean it up a little bit then come in with a dry rag and clean up the water. It's super, super easy to deal with squeeze out on pre-finished panels like this. And then last but certainly not least, we do need to hang this cabinet. So I'm attaching a French cleat to the back of the cabinet, only to the top. I'm not attaching the French cleat to the back panel because I don't want to lock that panel in place. It needs to be able to breathe and move with the seasons. So I'm just gonna clamp this in place for an hour or so, and then I have a really easy way to hang this on the wall with just a couple of screws. So that, friends, is cabinet number one. It's, it's a simple build. There's a lot of complex things going on, but overall, the core is just a big box. You've already made a box. Now we're taking a box and putting it up on the wall. So there you go. Now, as promised, as in the last video, there are a few techniques I want to show you for the more advanced variation on this project, should you so choose to take that one on. So let's dive into those. Now, the big difference joinery wise between the beginner cabinet and the more advanced cabinet is this joint I'm putting in the center here, the housed mortise and tenon. This is a variation on the dado. It's combining the dado with a mortise and tenon, in this case, a double mortise and tenon. It is a bomb proof joint. I use this in cabinets all the time, but normally what I do is use a slip tenon. But given the capacity of the Shaper Origin, it made cutting this integrated tenon version really, really simple and really, really quick. So what I'm going to do is cut both tenons first, and then I'm going to cut the shoulder around the rest of the joint. And again, I will provide you with the SVG files should you choose to attack this joint. And then after cutting both positive and negative, you can see you get a really tight joint and this thing ain't going nowhere. 
And just for posterity, you can see that I cut the sliding dovetails on the oak version of the cabinet just the same way as I did on the cherry version. And still a fantastic joint. And then another difference between the two cabinets is the frame and panel on the back. You don't need to do a frame and panel. As I said earlier, that panel is only going to expand and contract about a 128th. But if you do want the challenge of creating a frame and panel, if you want to up the visual capacity of the cabinet just a little bit, you can create a frame and panel pretty easy on the table saw, just doing stub tenons and making sure that you have expansion and contraction room for the panel in there. And I think it's a really lovely look. I think there's very few things that elevate a cabinet uh, outside than a really well-crafted and, and well-proportioned frame and panel in the, in the interior. And then just like I did the walnut pull on the drawer for the box, I did a brass pull for the door on this cabinet. The process is exactly the same. I turned it on a wood lathe. I just made it out of a different material. Then I popped some hinges on there using the hardware catalog, the same hinges from before, so it's still that CB303 installation. And then I made a couple of key hangers because the oak cabinet I wanted to use as an entry cabinet, uh, a little key cabinet inside my front door. And so I just took some bar stock, the same bar stock I made that brass pull out of, and I shaped it on the belt sander and the spindle sander, took it to the file, cleaned it up a little bit, chopped it off of the bandsaw. And you get this really lovely uh, little little hook for your keys. It's, it's simple, it's elegant, and it works really well with the back panel. And you just abrade the bottom eighth of an inch or quarter of an inch, depending on how deep your mortise is, put a little epoxy in there, and then you just glue them in. Then of course it's time to throw some finish on and you know, who doesn't love a good shot of this German apple being finished. It is this book match Wormy German apple is silly, I admit, but it is beautiful and it works really, really well with the oak. So there it is, friends. It's, I mean, it's an elegant little cabinet. It really is just, it, it can be a knickknack cabinet. It can be an entryway cabinet. There's so many things it could be. Um, and I just think it's a delightful little object. So just like last time, your educational goal should be to do something different from what I did. Whether that's the pull on the door, if you do the advanced version, whether that's changing the back panel on the simple version, whether that's changing the profile of the edges on the cabinet, whatever you do, do something different so you make one aesthetic design decision for this project. Risk failure, take risks, learn something from it. That's the whole point. So anyway, friends, I'm ecstatic about these first two projects and very, very excited about the next one. So until then, go make a thing. Go take a chance. And be good, make good decisions as always. Peace.